Thank you, Lee. Did you catch that? Across the street or around the world, the mission is still the same. You know, it's hard to keep focus sometimes on our mission. You know, yesterday we observed the uh, 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attack on the United States. Our lives have not been the same or as safe ever since. And you know what I find disturbing, especially as a former military uh, serviceman, we just handed back or surrendered Afghanistan to the Taliban who harbored and abetted Osama bin Laden and his organization in his terrorist attack on America. And many do not realize it, but, this, but America just opened ourselves up to more terrorism, more terrorism than ever before by this show of weakness. But that's not where I'm going. Now throw in COVID-19 pandemic. Throw that into the mix, and the whole world has changed. The entire world is a hot spot. No one is safe from anything, anywhere. So what are we as Christians, as the disciples of Jesus, what are we to do? I love that song. That was perfectly you see, our marching orders, the disciples' marching orders, is the Great Commission. We're going to be looking at that over the next few weeks. Our marching orders from Jesus has not changed. It has always been the same. Jesus commanded the Great Commission. And let me tell you, listen very carefully. You see, the world doesn't need new rules, doesn't need new laws, doesn't need new politicians. The world needs Jesus. Amen. We get the world accepting Jesus, and all these things will take care of themselves. This is so important that we're taking the next couple of weeks, that this week and next week, to look at just a few verses, the last few verses in the book of Matthew. Yeah, I understand, even our denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, they had voted a few years ago to adopt the descriptor, the Great Commission Baptist, as an alternate name for the Southern Baptist Convention. But here's a disturbing fact, though. According to a 2018 Barna Group survey, only 17% of churchgoers, understand the survey was given to churchgoers, not the public at large, to churchgoers. I like the way they phrase that. They didn't necessarily say Christians, but they did say churchgoers. He said only 17% of churchgoers had even heard of the Great Commission and knows what the term means. The remainder of churchgoers largely had never heard of it, 51%, with a quarter, 25%, saying they've heard of it, but they, they don't know what it means. Well, we're going to be covering that over this week and next, and this is one reason why it is so important that we understand this. This is our marching orders. This is the mission of the church, is the, uh, these verses about the Great Commission. Turn it, if, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew 28, the last page of Matthew in your Bibles, if you will. Matthew 28, we're going to be looking at verses 18 to 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, our understanding. Lord, that we might understand this commission, that we might understand these marching orders that you have given us, the church. And Lord, that we might carry it out to the fullest of our abilities. 
And Lord, we can't do any of it unless you lead us, you guide us, you empower us to do your will in the world around us, whether it be this neighborhood or on the other side of the earth. Lord, we are asking for you to touch us today. May we feel your spirit, and Lord, may Jesus be glorified in this place. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Today, we're going to be looking at what a commissioning is all about. Now, most of you know I'm retired from the Air Force after almost 25 years of service. And, and, and I want to mention a, a day in that t during that time, back on April 7th, 1981, a little over 40 years ago, was a special day for me. I was uh, standing with about 150 others on a very hot parade field at Lackland Air Force Base at the Officer Training School, and I took a solemn oath of office. No, that's not me. That's actually my son, Bobby, uh, in 2004 when he accepted a commission in the Marine Corps. He had just graduated from the Naval Academy. I'm very proud of him, as you must know. Uh, and, and, and actually, this picture was, taking, uh, was taken from the front page of the Marine Corps Times on June 1st, 2004. So he was, not that he was featured, but they caught his picture at any rate, taking the oath of office as he graduated from the Naval Academy. Now, he took the same oath that I took. And I want, to, I want to tell you what that oath was when I swore in. And it said, I do swa so solemnly swear I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I take this obligation freely without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, and I will well and faithfully discharge the duty of the office uh, on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. That was the oath that I took. And as a newly commissioned second lieutenant at the time in the United States Air Force, I took my commission very seriously, and it was a very proud, and it was also a very sober moment in my life. When we look at commissions, we look at lives that are offered, lives that are taken, lives that are changed, all on the strength of a commission, a commission inspired by a sense of duty, and in this case, the duty to a nation, a commission that has impacted every day of our lives from that day forward to this very day. I still hold my commission in the Air Force. I'm retired, but I still hold my commission in the Air Force. I still hold my commission. And commissions are like that when they're taken very seriously. Commissions are to be accepted. Commissions are to be obeyed. And commissions are to be fulfilled to the very best of our ability. Jesus was about ready to do some very serious commissioning. His disciples were about to graduate from a school of their own. And the Lord of the universe pronounced even a more demanding commission upon those who would follow him. It would impact all their lives. Every day, for the rest of their lives, and for eternity. This was the great commission which we had just read. Now, according to my United States Air Force commissioning certificate, and if you notice up at the top, it says the President of the United States. I was appointed by the President of the United States. It was Ronald Reagan at the time. And with the approval of Congress and by the authority granted to him and the U.S. Constitution. But why, what authority does Jesus commission us, his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Heaven and on earth, that's another way of saying the entire universe. 
all authority. Here it is. Our commission was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and creator of the universe, with all the authority and all the power that is in heaven and on earth. He was given this authority by God the Father. Now, comparing the two commissions, the commissioning of, uh, of a military officer and the commissioning that Jesus gives his disciples, which is more important? which is more life-changing, which is more powerful, which is more impacting to our world. Our concentration this morning is going to be on verse 18. We need to realize that Jesus had authority while on this earth. We're going to look at the authority of our commissioning this morning. We need to realize that number one, and I'm going to be listing a number of these, but Jesus taught with authority. On Wednesday nights, we're going through the, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. But at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 28, 29, it said that when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. You see, Jesus was the very source of the teachings. When I stand up here and teach and preach, I'm teaching from the Word. This is my source. You got to realize when Jesus taught, He was the source. In fact, over in John 1.1, 1, 1, where I preach from the Word, John 1.1 1, 1 says that Jesus was the Word and is the Word. Jesus was the Word. Number two, Jesus had authority over nature. Now you remember the story when Jesus uh, crossed over the lake in the boat and he went to sleep in the back and a big storm came and the disciples were upset that the boat was going to get swamped and we're all going to die and they said, don't you care? And they called upon Jesus and Jesus stood up in the midst of the storm and he said, peace, be still. And immediately, immediately, there was a great calm and the waters were still. Matthew 8, verse 27, it said, The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? They were terrified of the storm before. <laughs> they were really terrified now. <laughs> Who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus had authority over the demonic. He was teaching in the, in, in the uh, synagogues and uh, we, we, we know some of these stories from the gospel and how people were always getting, you know, the, the Pharisees and all were always getting after him for doing things on the Sabbath day. Uh, one such story from Luke chapter 4 verses 35 and 36 and it said, but Jesus rebuked him, talking to the demon if you will. He said, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of them without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon all of them, and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. Understand, Satan can't do anything, or any of the demons cannot do anything, unless God allows it. We read about that over in the book of Job. You remember book of Job, you know, and where uh, Job had all of these torments? It's only because God allowed them. And why does God allow things to happen like this? I don't know. You know, it's, uh, uh, as we study the Bible, you know, we've got a clear choice to make. Jesus had authority over all sicknesses and all diseases. It said, uh, in fact, we read in numerous places, but uh, the start of it said over in Matthew 4, verse 23, he said that uh, 
uh, Jesus was going through all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. In other places, it talks about how all the people were coming to Jesus, the, the lame, the crippled, uh, the blind, the mute, the deaf. They were all coming to Jesus, and Jesus was healing them all. Jesus had authority over physical death, over death itself. Uh, one such instance, uh, as Jesus and his disciples were going along the way and there was a funeral procession going on, and he came up and he stopped the procession. And we read this over in Luke 7, verses 14 and 15. And it said, he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearer came to a halt and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. You know, it's an interesting story because you gotta remember, uh, especially back in that day, there was no self-respecting rabbi that would ever come near a dead body. But here, Jesus came and he touched it, touched the body. Yet Jesus, it says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the life. Man wasn't dead when he touched him. Remember Lazarus. I love that story with Lazarus. You know, Martha said, oh, if you're only here. And Jesus said, you know, that he was the resurrection and the life. John 11, verse 25, if you care to look it up. Jesus had authority over sin. Over sin. You know, if you remember the story... Uh, the, the paraplegic, they can only reach Jesus by making the hole in the roof and they lowered it down to him. And what was it Jesus said to the man? He said, your sins are forgiven. Well, the Pharisees and the scribes, they got all upset with that. Who has authority to forgive sin? Matthew 9, verses 4 to 6. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to, to the paraplegic, he said, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Hard to argue with that. Jesus has authority over all flesh and all life, including eternal life. Uh, the prayer that Jesus prayed the night before he went to the cross, he said in that prayer, he's speaking to God in John 17, verse 2, he says, even as you, God, gave him, Jesus, authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Jesus has authority over everything. It's interesting when we look in the Bible and that as grand as these authorities were, it was not boundless at that time until after the resurrection. And after the resurrection, Jesus conquered death and he conquered the grave. And then Matthew 28, verse 18, this is after the resurrection and prior to his ascension back into heaven. It said Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority. We, we got to understand that word all. How much of all do, do, do we understand? All authority. All authority has been given to me. That word all, all authority, uh, it's gushia. In the, in the Greek, it means meaning all jurisdiction, all power. Power is part of that word, and it's the authority to rule. All authority, and it says, has been given. That's an interesting word when we look at the particulars here in the Greek, and the Greek tense is the aortist, uh, passive, indicative. It, it, means, it means that it has happened, and it is timeless. All authority has been given to him. It wasn't given to him and taken away. He has it. He possesses it even now. It is for all time. It is a permanent thing. Jesus had been given. And, ha and possesses even now all authority. And in fact, this isn't anything new because we read about it in the Old Testament. And let me give you just one such passage from the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 to 14. 
And this is Daniel writing. He says, I, I, I kept looking in the night vision and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him, that is Jesus, and to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. In his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. We forget that Jesus rules over all. He has all authority over all nations and over all things. In fact, the day is coming when all creation, all creation will bow down to him. You know this verse, Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. And he says, for this reason also, Paul writes, he says, for this reason also, God highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that at the and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The key is to all of this is who is bowing the knee now to Jesus. There's coming a time when there won't be a choice. All knees will bow and all tongues will confess. Jesus has every right to issue his church his church, which is his body, the body of Christ, to issue his church their marching orders. Jesus chose the church to do his work. He deliberately chose to work through his people. I mean, couldn't he command an army of angels to come down and deliver the message? I guess he could have, but he chose us. He chose us. He chose us. And, and, and when Jesus gave the commission, he spoke with a worldwide view, having all of history, past, present, and future, resting in his hands with all the resources of heaven and earth at his command. Jesus does not commission in sin without enabling, enabling. We read over in Acts just prior to his ascension, Acts 1 verse 8, you know this verse. He says, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. I like that song, Lee, you know. It doesn't matter whether it's across the street or around the world. The message is the same. The message is the same. Jesus charged 11 disciples with changing the world. Uh, there's every reason to think that not only were the 11 disciples there, that this is what's mentioned in, in Matthew, but there were probably others as well. But Jesus charged them, he commissioned them, and he sends them out with passion and with power, with power. And I want to skip to the very last line of, our, of this commission. The very last line, the very end of verse 20. And it says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's not like we're going out alone. But, you know, the thing is, we tend to be uh, full of excuses as to why we cannot do something. You know, if, if, if you look in your Bibles and you go back to, the, uh, uh, back to verse 16 and it says his disciples proceeded uh, to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus has designated, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. You know, we've got some doubt. There is some doubt. Well, Jesus gave this command and that's for the pastor to do. That's for the associate pastor. That's for the deacons. No. It's for everybody. It's for everyone. 
It's for everyone. But we tend to be full of excuses why we can't do something. You know, we doubt like the, like the people there as well. I, I can't speak a foreign language. I still can't speak a foreign language. You know, you know when, I was, uh, when we were in Indonesia, uh, I did go through a number of months of language tra training. And I went everywhere with my little dictionary. And boy, did I ever pray for the gift of tongues. Not, not to speak in an unknown language. I just wanted to speak Indonesian. Uh, but God used that. You know, there were a lot of Indonesians who wanted, me, wanted to help me speak their language. And I was able to communicate because of their willingness to help me. I, I can't speak a foreign language. Or, or people, and you've heard me say, talk about this time and time again, I can't teach. You can put your arm around somebody and mentor. You, you know, uh, it, a lot of times we can't teach because we haven't tried to. You understand that the gifts of the spirits are supernatural. You'd be surprised what you can do if God is calling you to do it. Amen. We just need to step out on faith and do it. You know, sometimes we say, well, I cannot speak well about my faith. I don't know what to say. Just say it. The Holy Spirit will put the words in your mouth. Also, when you go out and you step out on faith and, 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 and you go and witness, not only is the Spirit of God in you to speak through you, but you'll be surprised when you find out that the Spirit had gone out ahead of you and prepared the object of your witnessing. And all of a sudden, they're all ears. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on this uh, uh, in, in a few weeks, but it's that passage in uh, 1 Peter 3, 15, I think it is. It says, always be ready to give a defense. You know, when somebody asks the question, talked about this Wednesday night. But, you know, uh, I can stand up here and preach to my heart, uh, you know, preach my heart out up here, and there's no guarantee anybody's going to hear a word. But when somebody comes up in you and asks for the... Uh, Ask for the reason of the hope that is in you. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this fall festival? Speaking of things that are coming up. Why are you doing this for the community? Somebody's going to ask you that. And they're waiting for an answer. What an opportunity God has laid into your lap. And all you have to do is speak the truth. You, we got these excuses. I cannot do this and that. And we're called... We're called to step out on faith. We'll get into the particulars next week. But understand, Jesus has come to us with all authority and power of the universe, commissioning us to do his work. It is his spirit and his power that goes with us and ahead of us to do his work. Paul, Paul complained about his limitations. Paul complained about his limitations. He talked about that thorn in the flesh. I can't do it because I've got this disability. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he says, but he, that is Jesus, said to me, Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Because I can't teach, because I'm not very good at sharing my faith, but I've gone out, the Spirit's gone ahead of me, and great things happen. Who gets the glory? God gets the glory. He works through our weaknesses. He works through our weaknesses. And when the work is done, despite our limitations, Jesus gets the glory, not us. And when he gives us this commission, it's not a wish list. Jesus did not make a, a request, but it is a command. Peter explains to Cornelius. Remember, Peter was kind of hung up on going to the Jews or to the Gentiles. God showed him that he needed to also go to the Gentiles, so he goes to Cornelius, which was a Roman centurion, a centurion and, and, and he goes to him, and he was explaining to him over in Acts 10, verses 42 and 43, and it says, he ordered us, he ordered us, that is Jesus, he ordered us to preach to the people 
and solemnly uh, to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. So what are we choosing to do? Are we choosing to say it's nice for others but not for me? What will we choose to do as his disciples? To obey and fulfill the commission that he has given us or to ignore it? Jesus had some words about that. Luke 6, 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things that I say. Over in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He has commanded us to go therefore into all the world, making disciples. We'll get into that next week. Will we obey the call from the one who holds all power and all authority? This morning, perhaps, maybe there's someone here, someone listening to this live stream that doesn't have a relationship with the risen Lord. You cannot carry out his commands because you haven't placed yourself under his authority. His authority comes with power, by the way. You know, perhaps he wants you to clean up Perhaps you're saying, well, I can't command, uh, I can't do it until uh, I, I clean up my act. I, there's things i got to get straight first. You know, we come to Jesus and we let him clean up our act. <laughs> he lets, we let him clean us up. And he is asking you to come. He's asking you to place yourself under his authority. Because one day, one day, Everyone, as we read from Philippians, one day everyone will acknowledge his authority. The key is, is who does it today? Who does it today? And if we're under his authority and we're calling him Lord, are we doing the things that he has commanded us to do? But first, we must come to him. Come to him. Will you do it today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, may we be faithful in the commands that you have given us. May we be true to when we say that we love you, Lord, that we will do what you called us to do, whether it be across the street or around the world. Lord, may we be faithful to your call. May we just simply tell everyone what you have done for us. Lord, there may be someone that, that hasn't ever accepted Jesus and, and been placed under his authority. And Lord, I pray that a saving knowledge of you will be present today. And Lord, that it will be a drawing to yourself. And Lord, we just lift this all before you. That your will be done in this place and in the lives of all who are hearing today, that Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.